everyone for joining. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, as Alcina mentioned, is our choice for distinguished speaker. We have one of these per year, and so it's uh, quite the privilege. And again, it was a unanimous decision from the committee to have uh, Dr. Tim Behrens come and speak for us. Uh, Dr. Behrens is a professor of computational neuroscience at the University of Oxford and the deputy director of the Wellcome Center for Integrating, Integrating Neuroimaging, and also an honorary lecturer at the Wellcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging at UCL. Um, he's received numerous awards, including uh, the Blavitnik Award, Trolland Award, Young Investigator Award for OHBM, and others, and has lots of uh, service uh, duties for you know, editorial uh, responsibilities at eLife, as you, you may know, and other journals as well, PLOS, PLOS Computational Biology. Um, numerous citations, the, his Google Scholar is very intimidating to a, a assistant professor here. And one thing that I really respect about uh, Tim's work is the, the way to you know, use this sort of multimodal neuroimaging approach to, um, to answer questions that are human specific, but inspired by animal study findings. And so it really spans, it's really a perfect uh, speaker for this very diverse community here at UCLA, uh, where we use a lot of neuro you know, neuroscience techniques. And you know, it's a pleasure to have him, thanks for coming. And with that, uh, please take it away. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you, um, great honor. Um, and I hope I do it justice as I was saying. I'm going to, I am going to speak about some human data, uh, mostly human data, but um, also some modeling. Um, but I'm going to start uh, by showing you a mouse. Uh, this is a mouse. Um, and he has to, um, to go to four places in a row to get a reward. All right, so you can see he's gone to A, and now he's going to have to go to B. And he knows the way around this little maze. Um, uh, the, he has to go to them in order because the rewards don't appear um if they don't come out in order um uh so he has to go a b c d he's, he's going to c now uh and then d and he knows this he knows it because he's done it hundreds of times before <laughs> this is that same mouse um and he's doing the same thing but this time he's never done it before but he has done um five previous examples of the same problem but with the rewards in lots of in different locations on each time and so he he he, he can know that there's something like a b c d in the world but he can't know where they are and you can see he's just lost now he doesn't know where b is right and, and he's not going to know where b is and i'm just going to zoom it on a little bit he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't know where c is either he gets lost and he gets really lost going to d all in the wrong place but there's one thing that he can know in this new world on the very first trial if he knows this ABCD structure, uh, which is that he can know after he's found D, he can know to go straight back to A because he's just seen A. Uh, so the first element of the second trial must be A, the same as the first element of the first one. And so you can see he's just found D and he's gonna move straight back to A by the shortest possible route. <laughs> okay, so uh, that problem has an ABCD structure. This, um, this mouse has got to do two things. He's got to navigate in space and he's got to keep track of that ABCD structure. So my talk is going to say these two things are the same thing, basically, um, or the same, same mechanisms. Um, and it's going to try to show that if you realize this and think about the underlying, me that underlying mechanism, you can understand problems with all sorts of different structures. And so that's why it's how the brain can figure out the structure of problems. Um, that's the sort of take home is that by modeling sequences, uh, you can make some really rich inferences um, and predict some brain data. And so let's just start at the beginning now with, with space. Uh, this is a mouse that has um, uh, found some cheese using this rather tortuous route. Uh, if he's not uh, using the structure of sequences or the structure of the problem uh, to make inferences, uh, then the next time he wants some cheese, he has to take the same set of actions, the same torturous uh, actions. But if he understands that space is special, it has a 2D topology, if he understands the structure of space, then he can take a much shorter path uh, next time as this kind of thing that was studied uh, by Tolman in the 40s. All right, uh, good. Okay, and so we know a little bit about the uh, cells uh, that underlie these kinds of inferences. 
uh, in the spatial domain. Here's a couple of them. Uh, there's some uh, famous place cells and grid cells that won the Nobel Prize in the hippocampus for place cells and entorhinal cortex uh, for grid cells. There are also a bunch of other cells like this that all appear uh, to be uh, bespoke to space, like these um, uh, object vector cells, border cells, landmark cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, each with their own nature paper. Uh, so these things seem to solve this inference problem, uh, but, uh, but selectively or bespoke to space. And there's one other thing you need to know to understand some of this talk, uh, which is in humans at least, these grid cells are not only in the entorhinal cortex, and you guys must know that because you, uh, it was, that was discovered uh, partially uh, there in UCLA and partially, and partially at UCL. Okay, so there are also some of these grid cells in the, in the medial uh, frontal and medial parietal cortices. The, space isn't the only problem that the human hippocampus gets involved with. A human at least, also a uh, mouse, as discovered by uh, as uh, studied by Howard Eichenbaum. Here's another problem that also involves one of those structural inferences, using the structure of the world to make an inference. It's called transitive inference, and it goes like this. I tell you that A is greater than B, and that B is greater than C, and you can then make an inference uh, that A is greater than C, because you know that like greater than lies on a, a 1D um, uh, uh, topology. Or, Equivalently, uh, I take you down the gym um, and I show you Jane beating up Bob and Bob beating up Alice. Um, uh, you can have a pretty good guess about who's going to win a fight between Jane and Alice, right? So that's uh, that's a trend. That's also an inference. It's a one D one this time, not a two D one. Um, and uh, uh, that uh, inference also relies on hippocampus. Um, I could explain to you what all these little blobs are in Dash Kumaran's uh, study that showed that with fMRI, but it's easier to show you this uh, from Howard. Uh, who did this um, uh, experiment in, in rats and showed that after lesions either to the fornix disconnecting hippocampus from frontal cortex or to the entorhinal cortex removing all the sensory input from uh, uh, from hippocampus uh, animals can still make the trained pair the trained uh, decisions between bc and cd but can't make this relational inference uh, based on the structure of the world um, uh, the bd one all right so that also relies on hippocampus and we uh, have recently uh, been finding out uh, that those spatial cells that I told you about earlier uh, also seem to have, um, you seem, there seems to be something similar if you look uh, in non-spatial problems. And so here uh, are some uh, place cells recorded in David Tank's lab, um, but those place cells are, and they're, they're 1D, sorry, just so this, this is each one, it's not, I'm not plotting you a 2D thing like before, I'm plotting you uh, one, uh, one dimension here and different cells here. So you can see each, each cell's got a different place field um, uh, in 1D, but the animal is not running up and down a 1D track. He's listening, uh, or she is listening uh, to a 1D frequency uh, change. So it's going, he's listening to boo, and there are, that wasn't very good, but you see what I see. Uh, there are play cells if you, uh, uh, for particular frequencies, in that 1D frequency cell, and maybe some bumpy things that might be uh, grid cell-like if you were to measure in 2D. Um, but at the same similar kind of time, uh, we were uh, uh, measuring in a 2D um, uh, in a 2D task, uh, which was a long way away from from space. It was a conceptual space uh, where here uh, the two dimensions were the length of the neck and the length of the legs of, of birds. Uh, and but we were uh, so we had the advantage of being able to measure in two dimensions uh, non spatially, uh, but we had the disadvantage of not having um, electrodes uh, in there because uh, they were humans and we are not in UCLA, and so um, uh, so we measured with fMRI. But fortunately, fMRI there's this smoke there's a sort of smoke signal that you can measure from grid cells, which is quite precise to grid cells. It's like a hexam it's like a hexagonal signal, uh, and we managed to measure that in this totally non spatial. Um, uh, totally non-spatial um, uh, world. So it looks like a lot of these, uh, uh, so some of these same mechanisms might not be selective for space, uh, but might instead um, uh, be able to solve non-spatial problems. Okay, so that's kind of where this talk starts. I'm sorry, that was fast. Um, uh, the kind of puzzles we're interested in solving uh, is how can this relational inference uh, work uh, can the same system solve spatial and non-spatial problems 
Uh, why do the cells look like they do? Those are the kinds of questions we're interested in solving. Um, and uh, to answer those questions, I'm gonna try to take you at least at a high level through a computational model, but don't worry uh, if you are bored by the computational model because it doesn't last more than about 10, 15 minutes. And after that, there's lots of data. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'll just take you through this uh, at a high level. Um, uh, so um, if you're trying to build a model of something, you always have to start off by wondering what is the problem the brain is trying to solve? Um, and this is our take on, on it here. Um, if I tell you uh, that Janice has a brother, Bob, and a child, Alice, uh, then um, you, because you're clever humans, uh, can tell me lots of other things about this family. Uh, so here they are. Uh, you can tell me that Bob, for example, uh, is Alice's uncle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So because you're able to somehow path integrate uh, in this relational space that's non-spatial, you know uh, what all the different relationships and how they add, add up to each other. Um, that lets you do a relational inference. You can make an inference about uncles in this case. Um, uh, okay, that's one thing that needs to happen. Second thing that needs to happen is that you can learn this uh, relational inference, this, these, these relational inferences uh, in one family, um, and you can apply that uh, same relational structure to some new family uh, to immediately uh, make an, a new inference uh, without seeing uh, the links in this family, right? That's sort of the overarching problem uh, that we'd like to solve it. Um, I, I'm, it doesn't seem very concrete, so I'm just gonna show you um, in fact, the same problem, but a sort of more concrete version of this problem, uh, which is um, a problem that brain might be able to solve, uh, or a model might be able to solve. Uh, so here's, a, here, here's one. It goes, what's next in this sequence? Right, so it goes light bulb, right, broomstick down, um, uh, motorbike, right, et cetera, et cetera. Predict what comes next. And I guess none of you can do that. Um, it seems like an impossible challenge. Um, it is an impossible challenge unless you've seen lots of worlds before that have the same relational structure. Um, and then you can abstract this relational structure, the structure of the problem, which in this case is just 2D space. Uh, then, then you've got that structure and now you can bind uh, your stimuli to that structure and construct a map of your world and now that you know the light bulb is going to come next, right? That's actually exactly the same problem um, as the uncle problem I showed you before, uh, but now you can see that it's also a prediction problem. If I can predict things, uh, then I can uh, learn this structure, right? Um, so there's two things to take away from this. This is an abstraction and binding problem, and the other is you can solve it. If, if, you, could, if you could find something that would predict what was going to come next very efficiently, you would have solved this abstraction problem. Um, so, so maybe that's um, a way into the problem by training stuff to, 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 um, uh, uh, to predict what's gonna come next. Okay, cool. Um, so just to uh, reinforce this abstraction and binding uh, problem, we need somehow to re represent a, uh, an abstract relational structure like this. Um, and then we need some binding, some memory uh, to bind individuals uh, to the correct place uh, in this structure. Um, this is uh, my family being bound to the correct places in the family tree. Although they're a bit, young, they're a bit older than that now. Excellent. Uh, all right. Um, uh, so I'm just drawing this like this, uh, just to make the analogy to those of you who know the functional architecture of the hippocampus, because uh, here's a diagram of the functional architecture of the hippocampus, again by Howard Eichenbaum, one of my favorite scientists. Um, and um, uh, there are um, some inputs to the hippocampus here, uh, which look a little bit like those inputs that I was talking about before. Uh, here's that sensory input here in the lateral entorhinal area. Uh, here's um, uh, something that Howard used to call context uh, in the medial entorhinal cortex. Uh, Howard used to call it context uh, because he didn't like calling it space. Um, and um, then in the hippocampus, um, uh, he would argue, as many others have, uh, that the hippocampus binds together uh, these different types of um, information uh, to give you a relational memory, a thing in context memory, right? And so that looks exactly like the problem that I just uh, stated before. There's some kind of context thing, like where am I in this relational uh, uh, structure, uh, some sensory thing, and I've got to bind them together. All right, so just a, um, uh, we're just going to take Howard directly at his word, and we're going to make a really simple model that does this, and we're going to see what the representations look like. All right. <clears throat> 
Again, remember this model is going to be predicting sequences. This whole talk is about predicting sequences. Um, so this is a, this is that model. This is some um, uh, uh, this is some uh, neurons, uh, and they have to say something like, "Where am I in this abstract relational space?" Uh, this is some neurons that say, uh, "What is here? What's the sensory input?" Uh, and this is some uh, hippocampus, it's a Hebbian network. Hippocampus is going to bind the two things together. That's all the model is. Um, uh, so here it is again, uh, the MEC binding the LEC. We know what should go down here in this red thing. Every, lots of people have modeled sensory input in neural networks before, that's fine. Uh, what on earth should go up here in this blue thing? What is uh, a location or a coordinate uh, in your abstract relational space? And so the answer is, well, let's just let the network find out exactly the way that I, I told you before. Uh, we're going to try and predict what's going to come next. And whatever representation uh, makes, it, makes us best at predicting the next thing in the sequence, that's the representation we're going to put up here. And we're going to say, try your hardest to predict everything you can predict. What, which representation up here? What, what should the cells look like up here to help you do that? Right? That's the game we're going to play. All right. And we're going to train this thing on lots and lots and lots of maps that have different sensory stuff, uh, but have the same underlying relational structure, right? So the structure of the problem is the same, but the sensory stuff uh, is different. And um, uh, we're going to learn these weights to try and work out what the best possible representation is up here. <clears throat> um, and then the critical thing is this, it should be able to do exactly what that mouse could, could do that I showed you. It could should take a tortuous path, path like this, and then if I ask it to guess what the direct route would have been or the direct things would have been, it's going to infer, it's going to say, okay, uh, it's going to infer what happens. Oh, there's a motorbike up there. Uh, there's a shirt up there, even though it's never seen these, these shortcut links before, right? That's its job. It's going to make an inference. It's going to predict what happens through these shortcuts, even though it's never seen them because it knows the structure of the world. <coughs> Excellent, just like the mouse predicting the short route to the to the cheese. All right, sorry. Okay, I hope that's clear. Um, you'll be um, you'll be you'll be away from the torture shortly because now I'm going to show you it's it's all results and and then data from now on. Um, here, um, here's what here's the training just to just to be clear what's going on. Uh, it's trying to predict links it's never seen before, as I said. And just so I so people understand, the first time it ever sees one of these structures, it can't do it, right? If it doesn't know what a family tree looks like or what space looks like or whatever the relevant structure is, it can't do it. It scores zero on, on the inference of the, correct, of the missing link. Uh, however, uh, after it's seen lots of different family trees, it knows the structure of family trees, it can do the path integration, and now it can infer uh, all of the links on the family tree. So it works, right? Cool. All right, so if you ask, just predict what's gonna come next, um, uh, and what's the best representation to have in these blue things, this is the answer, right? The answer is, uh, as you can predict, um, if you're just wandering around 2D with nothing else, it's just grid cells, uh, that's the best thing to do. If there are borders around and objects around, uh, then you need border cells and object vector cells as well uh, to predict um, what's gonna come next, right? So these representations, um, could be th thought of as complicated things for navigation, or they could be thought of just an efficient model of sequences, a, 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 a nice model uh, of sequences that let you pr uh, predict uh, what's going to come next. Cool. Uh, if you look in the hippocampus of this system, because the hippocampus is doing that binding, it needs, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to select grid cell peaks, uh, but only the ones uh, that happen with, when it lines up with the particular sensory thing that it kept, that, that particular neuron cares about. And so you're going to get things that look like one peak of a grid cell, basically. Uh, one peak of a grid cell looks like a place cell. Um, and so in, uh, in um, hippocampus, you're going to get bit, um, big place cells because they're big grid cells and little place cells because they're little grid cells. Um, and you're going to get these, uh, the, these uh, other cells that bind with those object vector cells, for example. And you can see, again, the difference between place cells and grid cells is exactly the same as the difference between landmark cells in the hippocampus that are found in the hippocampus and object vector cells in the entorhinal cortex. You can see up here, uh, here are the object vector ones. The object vectors care about every object and tell you the vector representation to every object. Uh, they generalize, uh, but down in the hippocampus, 
uh, they care about sensory stuff as well and so they don't generalize uh, across uh, the different um, objects they only fire for some objects and not others right and that's true of landmark cells that you can record and it's also true of uh, the ones that we can uh, the, the, the ones that come out of our model because it's this binding thing okay uh good we're nearly through the modeling um uh, i just wanted to the, but the main point of the modeling is coming up now here's here's a model which is really about predicting sequences and doing inferences right making an inference about a sequence uh, that's what the model's about, but it can predict these nice spatial uh, responses uh, very accurately. But because it's a general model about sequence about predicting sequences, uh, it can also do other things that are not space, right? And so here's here's a problem with a slightly more complicated structure than space. I'll just start off one stage more complicated. Here's a um, uh, an, an alternation task. Uh, here's a mouse um, where that has to go uh, left, uh, then right, uh, then left, then back, then right, then back, then left. Um, uh, and in this task, uh, there's, it's not good enough just to remember space to know where you are. You also have to know what you did last time in order, if you want to predict what you're going to see next, right? Because if you went left last time, then, you'll, then you have to predict that you're going to go right next time. Uh, if, you go, uh, if you went right next time, you've got to predict that you're going to go left next time, right? Uh, so you need a better representation than just space uh, to be able to solve this task. Uh, but in fact, and so here's here are the actions in this task. But in fact, this better representation is is, is actually a, 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 you can actually draw as a loop uh, like this, um, and uh, all you need is place cells on this loop as well as place cells in space, and then you're great. You can predict everything again uh, because if this place cell is active, then you're going to go right this time, and if that place cell is going to go left. And so here's Tem uh, predicting a representation uh, for this uh, for this alternation task. Uh, which is exactly the representation uh, that, that you find um, in, uh, in um, uh, rodent hippocampus. Here are these, these famous cells called splitter cells, uh, which, um, uh, which do exactly that. They only fire when you're going left uh, or when you're going right. <clears throat> okay, there's one. Here's another sort of similar kind of example. Here's a mouse that has to uh, run around this maze uh, three times, uh, four times uh, to get a reward. Um, and he, um, uh, to do so, um, uh, yeah, and so, so he has to go one, two, three, four. Again, if he, if he wants to know where he is in this task and be able to predict the reward, then he needs to make representations uh, of several different kinds. The first representation he has to make, uh, according to Tem, uh, is, is um, according to this model, uh, is a place cell-like representation. It's the same on every lap. He has to make that because he needs to predict the thing that's coming like immediately next, right? But he also has to predict the thing, he has to know which lap he's on uh, in order to predict the thing that's gonna come um, in the, uh, uh, at the end of the fourth lap. And so Tem says he also has to make these other kind of play cells which are only, they're only active on one lap. Um, actually there's a third thing that Tem thinks it, that you need because you can't move between one of these lap cells and another. Uh, without these cells that count the laps, go sm small, bigger, bigger, firing more as the laps go on. Um, and indeed, when you go and uh, when Tonegawa lab goes and records from this task, uh, you see exactly that. You see some place cells, some lap specific place cells, and then these counting cells uh, that slowly grow uh, as the laps come on, but again are place specific. Cool. So somehow, in all of these, um, uh, in all of these uh, representation, uh, re representations that we're predicting, what's happening is we're inferring latent states. We're, we're inferring things that are um, that you need to know to predict something in the future, but don't affect what your observations are uh, right now. And I'm just going to show you one other example of this because it's a really recent one and a really fun one. But I think it's exactly the same. So it's a Nature paper from from Tank Lab. It's exactly the same as these other. Once you, once you think about a sequence with latent states in them, so observations can be repeated, that kind of thing. Once you think about that sequence of latent states in them, this task here, which was just in nature this year, last year, is exactly the same as a splitter cell. Is exactly the same as a um, uh, as that lap counting cell. Um, so this task goes as follows. Uh, I, it's again one of these T mazes, uh, but instead of um, uh, of doing left, right, left, right. Uh, now you have to count the number of pillars uh, before you uh, get a reward and you have to turn left if there are more pillars on the left uh, and turn right if there are more pillars on the right. 
so uh, to solve that task, of course, you have to uh, know where you are because you have to know when you, uh, what the sensory input is going to be right now, and you have to um, and you have to know when you're going to make the turn. Uh, so you need one dimension, uh, which is uh, position. Uh, but but somehow you also need to know how much evidence, how many pillars you see on the left minus the pillars on the right, uh, because that will tell you how many more pillars on the left you have to see before you change your mind to the other one, if you see what I mean. So that's the relevant task variable, but left minus right pillars, right? And so um, uh, uh, the argument in that paper is that they should uh, represent that uh, left minus right pillar, and that's what the neurons represent. I'll show you in a second in hippocampus. So they have this two dimensional space where one dimension is position, and the other is this really funky cognitive variable, the evidence for left minus right uh, at the moment, right? It's a bit <clears throat> and it, but, but it doesn't need to be a funky cognitive variant variable because a model that just predicts the next thing in the sequence has exactly the same representation. It needs to build uh, that exact same representation in order to know uh, what's, what it's going to see next. And so that's what uh, 10 builds in this situation. And so here are some, some place cells in this wacky two-dimensional space uh, in a model, and here's one uh, recorded in hippocampus. Um, and similarly, um, this is the whole map. Uh, and, and again, uh, the recorded one, they look very similar. So this is like a beautiful demonstration. I love, I love this paper, but I think in some very deep way, it's exactly the same, uh, uh, exactly the same as, as a splitter cell. Cool, okay, so th that's the end of my modeling section. Um, I'm through it in reasonable time. Um, uh, it, if you think about space as sequences, or if you think about just modeling sequences and abstracting these coordinates, the structure of sequences, uh, so that you can do fast inference, uh, then you can maybe explain Euclidean geometry, transitive inference, uh, these state spaces for RL. I was, I was talking about these latent states at the bottom. Um, I didn't really go into stereotypical behaviors, but you can also explain uh, like things like running around walls. And, uh, and finding apples in a similar um, in a similar way, moving towards rewards. Um, so all of those things. So that's I, I think a reasonably general way of thinking about uh, a lot of problems that seem superficially distinct. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but all of those are sort of a bit spatial, right? Um, and so I'm going to try to take you to take us out of everything I've shown you so far. At least there's a mouse running on a somewhere, even if the problem is is non-spatial. The mouse is running on stuff. So I'm just going to take you uh, out of that domain quickly uh, and think about a non-spatial, uh, some non-spatial tasks. Um, and I'm going to be looking for something similar from what to what I've been saying before. These abstracted uh, coordinate systems uh, that uh, that know something about where you are. In the task, but but not about the individual example that you're looking at now, right? Okay, uh, cool. So our non-spatial sequences are represented abstractly, and this is a study by Anna Spector, um, uh, who has done some, um, who's been, who's who's got some single unit electrophysiology data uh, from humans uh, during epilepsy surgery. Um, uh, but and what they're doing is they are. Um, uh, remembering a sequence of four items. So in this case, um, dog, uh, football, keys, um, uh, chili pepper. And then three seconds later, they are asked to, uh, where was the football, right? And in this case, it was second. Um, and the critical thing here is that the stimuli, the same stimuli are on every trial, but they're in a different order on each trial. And so that it's a sequence memory task, right? And what we're gonna look for uh, we're interested in these coordinate representations, right? These abstractions of a sequence. Um, and so we want to know if, if, um, uh, if cells uh, represent not only the items themselves, but also the coordinates where they are in that sequence. And so I'm just quickly gonna show you a couple of uh, slides on the answers to this. Um, so first, I'm just gonna convince you we can uh, record something about the task. And so uh, here, here are some picture cells. Um, and so this one here, just, to, just so you can read what you're seeing, uh, this cell here um, is firing for picture one, no matter which position it's at, right? So it fires for picture one at position one or picture two at position one, uh, so picture one at position two or picture one at position three, et cetera. A, there's a high firing rate um, uh, for always a picture one, right? So that is a dog cell. This cell here is firing for picture three, 
uh, um, uh, again, at all positions. So that is a, a key cell, right? So those are the kinds of cells that, uh, that uh, many people have seen um, uh, in hippocampus before, including uh, you guys. Here are some cells that may be more interesting. So this is a cell that fires whatever the picture, uh, but always uh, in, only when it's in position one, right? And here's a cell down here that fires uh, whatever the picture, uh, but um, when it's in uh, position three, not when it's in position one, two, or four. And then here's another cell that fires for all pictures, uh, but never in position one, but for all of the uh, all of the other positions. Right. So that's these cells are coding for a coordinate in a sequence, uh, a little bit like grid cells do code for a coordinate uh, in space um, that then the sensory stuff can get bound to, as I was showing you in the model earlier, and, the, and why we think place cells are. Okay, um, uh, and these these coordinate cells are um, uh, are not uncommon, right? So uh, here is the total variance explained by the data uh, of the task. Um, P that P the P P not point not five is down here. So this task is explaining a lot of data. Uh, so that the uh, there's, there's a there's no we're nowhere near the the, the p value threshold that we care about. There's a lot of variance in here, but there's roughly the same amount of variance uh, for pictures and positions. Um, so um, the, uh, there are as many or more cells that care about what, that care about the position independent from the picture as there are that care about the picture themselves. It's a big representation. Okay, so that was a boring coordinate system. It was a coordinate system, but it was quite a boring one. It was just one, two, three, four. Here's a more interesting coordinate system, I think. Uh, it goes uh, breakfast, work, work, dinner, sleep. Uh, breakfast, work, dinner, sleep. It's like the, 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 the pattern uh, of your, of your uh, life, or at least my life. Um, and just to realize why this is a coordinate system, it seems like a sequence, but it's actually a coordinate system uh, because um, this guy here, th this dinner that you had on this Tuesday or whatever, is at coordinate two, three, uh, because it's on the second day um, and it's the third thing that happened uh, on the second day. This is a hierarchical coordinate system and you can make it more hierarchical uh, by um, uh, by putting a weekend in the middle, for example, uh, and so this is um, a coordinate. This this guy here is now at coordinate two two one because it's the second week. It's the second day of the second week, um, and it's the first um, element, uh, first thing you did on that second day, right? So this is um, now turning into quite a complicated hierarchical coordinate system, and we're interested in that kind of hierarchical coordinate system because of this. Right here is another complicated hierarchical coordinate system that we know about uh, in the mouse brain. It's the uh, grid cells again, uh, but they are. Um, uh, but that there's more than one length scale of these grid cells, and they factorize in this nice hierarchical way. Um, so the um, all of, most the, the small ones are predominantly uh, at the at the uh, dorsal end of the entorhinal cortex, the top of the entorhinal cortex, and the big ones. Uh, prominently at the ventral end, the bottom of the uh, entorhinal cortex, and there's this nice gradient, right? Well, um, uh, in human, people who study humans will know that this dorsal ventral gradient isn't really dorsal ventral in humans, because um, the human brain is sort of squirged round, uh, and so it's more like an AP anterior posterior gradient in humans. And so we were wondering if, if we could do a task looking for one of those coordinate systems, hierarchical coordinate systems, in non-space, in sequence land, um, uh, uh, that um, and see if it might have a similar kind of gradient uh, to it as the gradient I showed you, uh, as a gradient you can see uh, in the um, in the mouse called the rat. Okay, so here's how we did this. This is a fMRI study. Very quickly, um, uh, it's um, uh, what's happening is subjects are listening to an auditory sequence. Um, but it's a rich hierarchical auditory sequence. Um, it looks like this. Uh, here, just like the, 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 um, the meals and the working and stuff I showed you before, here are the meals, but they're, they're tones. It goes boop, 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 boop. And then they're, they're structured into days. Uh, the green things are days. So it's boop, 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 boop. And there's a weekend, beep, beep. And so it goes boop, 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 boop. Boop, 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 bo
so this is the uh, that's how um, that's how it works. It's got four levels. Uh, this hierarchy, and it's a sequence with 120 odd notes um, that takes about two minutes to play, um, and um, uh, and um, subjects uh, have some headphones uh, and they listen to it um, nonstop for two days. Very frustrating, very very irritating for the subjects. Uh, but by, by the end of it, they know those that, that sequence very, very well indeed. There's one other thing I didn't tell you, which is there's actually two sequences, not one that they're listening to, um, uh, and they, uh, they get hold of them. We need that because we want to prove it's a coordinate system, so it generalizes across sequences, right? Uh, okay, the two sequences have the same structure, as you'd expect, but different notes. <clears throat> Excellent, okay, so we do that. So we now have some subjects that know very well these uh, these these two um, these two uh, very complicated sequences or sequences, and now we're going to play a trick. We're going to bring them back on the third day, and we're going to play those sequences again. But this time we're going to have a computer screen there, and we're going to show. Sorry, we're going to play them twenty five times each sequence, and each time and and, and we're going to show some pictures at particular points uh, in that sequence. All right, and so. If we've done this correctly, then this apple is not just a picture of an apple anymore. It's a picture of an apple with a coordinate 1114. And this uh, book is not just a picture of a book anymore. It's a picture of, it's a picture of a book with a coordinate 2122. Two, two. And now we're gonna, and, we're gonna, and so that now we've got these tagged images, we're gonna lose the auditory sequence completely. And we're just gonna take those tagged images into an fMRI scanner, and we're going to show them in a random order, right? So all the subject is doing in the fMRI scanner is looking at images in a random order, but those images have got these, ta these tags on them. And we're asking, okay, uh, uh, if I look at this neural similarity between these images, can I see some representation of those coordinates in them? Are they correlated, are the distances between these, these <clears throat> images correlated with the distances between the coordinates and if so, are those layers represented separately, just like they are uh, in the entorhinal cortex of a mouse in the grid layers, right? That's the game, and here's the data. So remember, you're looking for this AP gradient. And if you look, first thing we're gonna do is show you all layers averaged together. If you do that, you find the hippocampal signal, but that's not what we're really interested in here. Um, this is the money shot, which is that if you look for each of the layers separately, uh, you find this uh, in the entorhinal cortex, uh, which is that the fastest layer, the meals in that hierarchy, have a representation um, in layer uh, in the back of the entorhinal cortex, and the months have a representation at the front of the entorhinal cortex. Um, and uh, and these are just and these are just coordinates. They're not listening to these uh, sounds during the scanner. They're just seeing these uh, these images that are tagged with these coordinates. And you can see this, this clean gradient as you go back. Okay, cool. Um, this slide, I'm not really gonna explain. I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you that it proves that, that, that this representation generalizes across those two sequences. So it's really a coordinate. It doesn't care what the, what the image was or what the uh, sound was at that particular point in the sequence. All it cares about is the coordinate and the layer that it's in. This is the second one. This is number two in layer four, right? Oh yeah, let's come up again, cool. Okay, Though, so if we think that what's happening around here is, is a sophisticated model of sequences somehow, which include, which, which, which often are spatial and so grid cells are very prominent, but there are other sequences that can be modeled too then it should be possible to make inferences about those sequences from that model, right? It should be able to, to, to generate sequences uh, from that model. Um, I, so I, um, I'm just gonna quickly show you a, a few slides showing that we think that you, we can do that. Um, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, first introduce something that I'm sure you all know, which is hippocampal replay, um, because this is like sequences uh, from a model. And so here are these place cells uh, that happen when a mouse uh, is traveling on a tr track. Um, uh, here uh, is what happens later when they're dreaming. Uh, you can measure this, uh, this sharp wave ripple um, uh, in the local field potential. 
And if you go and look at what the cells are doing in the hippocampus, then uh, then they're playing out uh, the same pattern as the as the pattern or uh, as the pattern that was uh, was measured uh, when they um, uh, ran on the track, but they're playing them much 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 faster. And this is called a hippocampal replay. I'm not going to dwell on it because I know you all know it. All right. Uh, so we're going to try and do that using human MEG, uh, magnetoencephalography, um, uh, to try uh, 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 to try to measure uh, this replay in humans and ask, can it spontaneously generate something from a learnt model? Right. Okay. So this is just a quick aside, uh, just to how how you go about measuring uh, replay in humans. This is how we do it. Um, we take a bunch of images. We show the subjects a bunch of images in a scanner. Um, and we um, measure the sensor pattern on the scalp uh, for all of these images. All right, and then we um, do, and then we um, teach them to put these uh, images into a sequence, like this one, A, B, C, D, uh, and then um, uh, and then we let them rest, and then we do some task that uses that sequence. And so the, the critical thing is then do the picture sensor patterns activate during rest? And if so, uh, in what order do they activate? Well, that's the critical question. And I'll just show you a few examples of those activations that look like replay, uh, which is, um, uh, here's one that goes uh, stimulus A, stimulus B, stimulus C, stimulus D. You can't quite see the, the thing there, but it's there. And then A, B, C, D. These are the kind of things we're looking at. This is a reactivation of those sensor patterns in an order. And here you can see they're about 40 milliseconds apart. Okay. Um, but uh, just showing you those things doesn't tell you the answer. We have to do some stats. And so we made a, a way of doing some stats on this. Um, and this is the kind of uh, answer that you get at the end of the day, just so you can read this graph. Uh, it says um, these uh, sense patterns do play, play out in the order A, B, C, D, uh, because this line is, a, is up here above the dashed uh, multiple comparison corrected um, uh, shuffle um, permutation test. Um, you can see that if we'd chosen a different order, D, A, C, B, the wrong order, we wouldn't have measured something like here's a control order. The next thing you can see is um, uh, we, uh, the, this replay is really quick because it crosses that line here at about 40 milliseconds and nowhere else. Uh, and then you can see that it's going in this case forward uh, because it's going up. If it was going backwards, this, this line would have been going down, right? I'm not gonna explain exactly what this is, but um, that's how you read the graph. Okay, uh, the last thing to, to mention uh, is something that Bujaki suggested we do uh, and which worked really well, which is that if you um, measure, look at all those replay events and just align the, the, the overall bulk power spectrum onto those replays, here's the replay onset, what you can see is, some, is a big power deposition roughly in the sharp wave ripple band um, at the time of these replays. So it looks like we can measure sharp wave ripples and replays uh, in humans. Okay, so that was my little aside on that. Um, can it generate new sequences uh, from a learned structure? Um, well, to do that, um, uh, so the question is this, did our replay look like this, which is what is often assumed in, uh, in the rodent literature ABCD, or is it more the, kind of the thing that I was showing you from, from those cells of Anna's earlier, uh, where it went uh, one, two, three, four, which was in this abstraction uh, bound uh, to this other representation of the pictures, which is what we've been saying uh, is true of, of, of many of, of, of almost all the data I've shown you so far, these coordinates uh, up here. Uh, and if it has these coordinates, then the point of having them is that you can make inferences, you can immediately put together a new sequence uh, with different pictures, uh, you can do this kind of inference. Can it do that, right? Okay, um, so this is how we ask that question. Um, we show them some sequences that they're not that, that we're not interested in, but which have a mapping to sequences that they are interested in. And we, we do this the day before, and we try to train them on this mapping so that they know it's literally like, okay, this one up here, the first one in the first sequence gets moved down here uh, to the set to the last one in the second sequence, right? They learn this whole mapping the day before. Uh, it's and and so what this means is, the next day in the scanner, we can show them brand new sequence. We can we can show them brand new images in an order that is not the order that we care about. So none of the transitions 
are ret retained. So let's say we're measuring uh, uh, we're measuring uh, transitions to measure a sequence. That the ones we've shown them are all different from the ones that we care about. Um, but nevertheless, see if there's replay of these inferred sequences that they've never seen um, uh, in, the, in the scanner. <clears throat> so next day, difference in the same structure. And if you look at the, for the, um, for the, uh, the um, stimuli they actually store, uh, then there's no replay of that memory at all. There's no memory replay at all. There's only replay uh, of this unjumbled inferred sequence uh, that they were able to infer uh, from <coughs> from uh, um, from that rule. I'm I'm gonna um, just I realize it's quarter two. Um, how just how many more minutes do you want me to speak for? Just quickly because I might skip some slides if there's only five more. Uh, I think I mean we have till one. So if you want some questions, maybe you. If you before. Yeah. Okay. I'm just gonna skip some stuff. I'm just I'm gonna. Uh, this, what this is showing is that I can measure those coordinates themselves. And then this thing here says that those coordinates themselves, uh, this thing here says those coordinates, not the stimuli, also replay. And they're, and they're replaying in the rest uh, before the, um, uh, before the uh, subject ever saw any stimuli at all, right? They're just like, they're saying, I remember the structure, here are the coordinates, they haven't seen the, the, the stimuli, they're just replaying out uh, this position code, the structure. You'll understand the relevance of that in one second, because what I'm about to show you is the same thing in that in, in mice and the same representations in mice in actual replay where you can see the cells. <clears throat> this is the end of my talk now. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you what the cells looked like in that original thing. Can you all remember at the beginning of this talk a very long time ago, I showed you a mouse, right? Doing an inference task in a sequence. So, and I'm, I'm just gonna record, I'm actually recording from medial frontal uh, here, not from enterorhinal for various reasons that I can go into later. Um, uh, but also remember in the medial frontal cortex of a human, there are these grid cells. So something similar is happening there as well. Uh, this is what the cells look like here. Remember it's an ABCD task, just like the one, two, three, four task that I showed you in the human cells or the one, two, three, four replay task. Now it's an, I'm calling it A, B, C, D. This could be one, two, three, four as well, uh, but it's um, uh, but it's one, two, three, four physical locations here. Um, this cell fires at B more than anywhere else, right? It's a B cell. It cares about B, but what it shows, what, but this is it firing at B in two different uh, where, where worlds where B is at totally different place in the two worlds, right? So here is B uh, down here in the bottom right, and here is B over here. Uh, so it's a two very spatially different positions, but it's also, but, it, but, but those positions are at the second uh, part of the sequence in each case. This cell is like an abstract state, state cell saying, I'm at the second reward. Right, here are some other ones. Here's a D cell, one that's just after D, uh, and there are loads of them. Uh, here, this one's just after A. Um, so this is like a, a map of the, coordinate space, the abstract sequence coordinate space, not of the physical space, right? Uh, so, so these cells are coordinate cells, um, but there are some other cells that seem not to be coordinate cells. This one fires for B in, um, uh, in, in task one, but D in task two. And so a reasonable question you could ask of me is, okay, have you just picked out these cells because they look like coordinates? Or is, it, is that what the population is doing? Well, to show you that I can, I can do this. I can measure the angle in the, uh, between, uh, between uh, where this cell fires for task one uh, and task two. And so this cell here, this B cell, the angle is zero because it fires at B in both locations. And then I can just plot the histogram of all these cells across the, across the whole, anything that's state selective. Um, and I can show you that the vast majority of these cells have angle at zero, which means the cells, the whole population uh, generalizes, uh, and this is uh, representing uh, an abstract coordinate space uh, for this uh, for this sequential task. <clears throat> and then, if you look in sleep, uh, in just before, just between the two tasks, between the task before and the task they're about to do, um, the rewards change, uh, you see these kind of things. 
Uh, these are uh, during shockwave ripples. Um, and you see, uh, this is a, a replay of, of, this one goes A, D, C, B. This is a reverse replay. This is a forward one, it goes uh, B, C, D. Uh, these ones are actually uh, quite hard to find. There are loads of these reverse ones, 21% uh, of ripples have them and they're highly significant. This is a reverse replay of the um, coordinate space, actually just like that thing uh, I just uh, showed you before. Um, uh, <laughs> just like that, and, and notice, noticeably, uh, this one I showed you before, which was between when the subjects learned the structure and they saw the stimuli in the MEG task. And this one here is between when they learn this, the mice learn the structure and see the new reward locations uh, in the mouse task. They're both going backwards. They're both playing the coordinate space out. And this is fun as well, because these are the, the timings. And so this is 50 milliseconds to about 200 milliseconds, about 160 milliseconds, 170 milliseconds uh, to play out four things. And so the timing is about 40 milliseconds apart in the rodent replays. And here in the human replay that we found um, beforehand, uh, the timing is also about 40 milliseconds apart between the four states. Last thing I want to show you, which is I think is fun, and then I'm going to end, uh, which is that there are not only these state, these generalizing state selective cells, uh, but there's also some other cells that look like they might uh, be abstractions, uh, but um, uh, but they don't care about where you are in, in the high level sequence. They care you care about where you are in the low level sequence. So this cell here is saying, I'm 60 percent or 75 percent of the way. Uh, to my to my next goal, and I don't care whether that goal's A or B or C or D. I'm about seventy percent of the way there, right? So that's the current sequence I'm doing in a low level sequence. I'm seventy percent of the way there. This one's about fifty percent of the way there. It's firing I'm about halfway towards my uh, current sequence. It does that in both worlds. It's not a spatial thing, and it does it for all of them. But notice something cool, which is that it it, it fires. This one's 70% between A and B, uh, but also 70% uh, between C and B, D. But getting from A to B is a long, torturous journey, whereas getting from C to D, they're just neighbors, right? And so uh, it, it's, it's marking out the length of your task, and it's saying I'm about 70% of the way along my current sequence. And so somehow uh, these, these uh, hierarchical levels of cells are, are um, in are like the one dimensional versions uh, of grid cells in, um, uh, in the 2D. Uh, but, and, they, and they're there in these, uh, these hierarchical modules. Uh, all right, uh, that's um, all I have to say. Um, uh, possible se sequences in the real world have rules and structure. They can be learned by predicting sequences. Um, and th this line of argument makes it possible to think in similar ways about lots of very, very different problems. Um, and um, these are the people that did the work. Sorry that went on a bit longer than I should, and I feel like maybe I, uh, yeah, anyway. Thanks, Tim. Fantastic. I'm sure there are lots of questions. So.